Welcome everyone to yet another episode of Out of Band. My name is Faith Appeal. My name is Jennifer Winnikers. And we are Out of Band. Today we are very pleased to have a malware analyst, malware expert, join us in today's discussion of mal malware analysis. Um, Max, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Max Kerste. I often go by the nickname of Libra Online, and I'm a malware analyst uh, currently at Trellix. That is the merge of FireEye and McAfee Enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also do malware analysis in my spare time. Um, I like it as a hobby as well, which is <laughs> how I got into it originally, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, Shot, you have no life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I need to touch grass some uh, sometime more outside. Yeah, but um, so yeah, I, I like what I um, what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been speaking at conferences uh, in some places. Uh, I publish blogs both for corporate and for my uh, on my personal website, mm -hmm. and I run a few groups on Telegram, uh, partially related to malware analysis, partially to somewhat adjacent topics such as incident response, daily SOC tasks, um, but also general reverse engineering. And that is anything that is legal. So uh, anything good disclaimer. that's- disclaimer. Yeah, it's, uh, we get a lot of questions in the groups from people who want to either um, illegally obtain certain software or I don't know, other illicit means. And those are uh, either warned or directly banned from the group. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we have a very strict policy there because it's kind of a, a gray area, right? Yeah. If you're reversing something in your house because you don't trust your um, smart vacuum cleaner that has a pretty legit use case, mm -hmm. whereas uh, cheating in some games yeah. is already... Is it, if it's a single-player offline game, then I guess Maybe. it's not too bad. But if it's a multiplayer game online, uh, I don't want to be supporting that or faci facilitating an area where, where that's supported so uh, okay so you you consider yourself ethical in some I, I would like to think so form. yes <laughs> yes I love that introduction like seriously I want to know more about it later on um but maybe let's start with the basics like how did you get into this whole what this whole world so it it started um for context, this year I'll turn 28. Uh, it started when I was about 12, 13-ish, so uh, first class of uh, high school. Mm -hmm. And I was interested at the time in how to program. I had no clue, so um, I started looking online for, mm -hmm. uh, for information, essentially. And I found out how to build a website with HTML and, nice. uh, and some, some CSS as well to give it some fancy looks. Mm -hmm. And that was at the time where, at least in high school, we were still using Word 2003 with like the word art, which had like the rainbow yeah. colors and all the, the only thing that was missing essentially was, was Comic Sans uh, on, the, on the website. <laughs> uh, so th that's how I started out. And later on, I transitioned to uh, visualbasic.net. Uh, and that was relatively new at the time mm -hmm. um, because previously Visual Basic 6 was the thing. Um, I kind of just skipped that one and I only learned about its existence later and I went into the, uh, nowadays you have Visual Studio, which mm -hmm. allows you to do that for multiple types of languages. But back in the day, Visual Studio was a, a paid tool, but mm -hmm. you had the Express Edition. So I had the Visual Basic 2008 Express Edition, which was like Visual Studio, but then only for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I taught myself how to, to program in there. Nice. Um, so looking back at that for those who aren't aware of how programming works you have uh, some code that, that essentially does something for you and if you have let's say a a, um, a window on your screen with mm -hmm. buttons on it if you click that button a certain event triggers the button click and if your mouse moves over the button you already have a mouse entering the button event mm -hmm. that you could trigger or a mouse that leaves the button field now I wasn't aware of such events. So I did everything with timers that did a one millisecond check if mm -hmm. something that I wanted to happen happened and then I did something else. So um, efficiency wasn't really, uh, <laughs> well, it was a priority but I just couldn't get that down. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, overall, I wrote fairly complex tooling still for the young For a 12 year old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote like a small web browser to do some stuff with a uh, media player. And these were all based on like the Windows components that the, the program offered. So uh, it was more like digital Legos, I would say, uh, looking mm-hmm. back at it, right? It's, it's not like I built the whole parsing for a web browser, et cetera, because that's way too complex. And uh, yeah, I, I just continued with that. And after high school, uh, I did half a year of law school. That didn't work out. That's kind of uh, different. <laughs> that is very different. I always thought myself to be interested in computers, but I always said to people like, nah, I'm not going to make that my job. It will be boring. Oh. Little did I know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like some, some, some movie which starts and you have that record scratch and it's like, this is where I'm now. You're wondering how I got here, right? So, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I dropped out of law school. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't meant for me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? So I, I signed up for uh, IT. Mm-hmm. Um, that matched perfectly. I learned how to actually do stuff with events. So my tools became actually useful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And from there on, I was, I think it, in high school already, it piqued my interest for security. Uh, but I never understood enough to actually mm-hmm. do anything with it. I found it fascinating, but it's more like how how... I don't know if you're a young kid and you look at like Formula One, you're like, wow, fast cars. Um, security was the same at the time. And then, uh, yeah, I started digging into that and essentially it just never let go. Wow. Um, so was, I spent a lot of time there, uh, but the whole education was more meant towards pen testing, uh, yeah. which is great, but somehow bores me. Um, I like to read about it. Uh, especially the creative solutions that people mm-hmm. have. I have a lot of respect for the people that do that. But um, for me, I don't know, I can look for ages at some code and figure out what it does, but I, I just cannot bring myself to do pen testing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I spoke with the teachers and they told me like, well, you don't have to do that if you have something else that is also security related. So I told them, mm-hmm. I want to do reverse engineering. So I remember, I think it was in 2018, I reversed some some program at the Capture the Flag game we read, and I was just learning how instructions were working and what tools even existed for it. Um, and then from there, I, I picked it up. Um, I had a uh, internship during my uh, bachelor mm-hmm. uh, in Android model reverse engineering, which is helpful um, because you get uh, if you if you convert your application, if you decompile the application into source code again uh, or a source code representation thereof you get java which is a lot better to read than assembly yeah and given that i was an am proficient in java that even helped me further so i didn't have to learn the assembly and the way of thinking and analyzing at the same time because i was doing something in a language i knew uh, so i did that i did that as a, as a side job as well as a part-time job and next to my studies afterwards and uh, then I moved over to the, uh, well, the way I refer to it is like the desktop platform. So mm-hmm. we have Windows, Linux, mm-hmm. technically Mac as well, but uh, never did anything with that. Yeah. Um, and just started doing stuff there. Uh, worked at the Even Emerald Bank uh, in the threat intelligence team for two years. And then I moved over to well, what was briefly called McAfee Enterprise. Uh, but then was bought and rebranded as as Trellix in the merge. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the the backstory, so to say, mm-hmm. of how I got there. And I think in 2019 I started my website, um, writing blogs. I think I bought it in 2017, but didn't do much mm-hmm. with the domain for like two years straight. Right. I think that's how it usually goes. Usually, you buy yeah. the domain name and you're like, oh, I forgot I have I need this. Need to do one. something. Until you get that mail, like it's about to expire, right? Yeah. automatically renew you know as in yeah well, you get a <laughs> notification at the end of the year that you need to renew your domain for me it's even worse i just have a subscription it gets automatically renewed and you're like oh okay i have that sorry no. um maybe like based on the responses that both faith and my, um, myself gave when you said yeah and then i went into reverse engineering that that's quite a big step like <laughs> yeah 
of maybe for the audience, like what is reverse engineering actually? So let's assume you have a, um, well, any program really, mm -hmm. technically, right? Just ignoring the increase in difficulty for one thing or another. Um, let's say you have a program and you want to know how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's open source, you can view the source code, which is the easiest mm -hmm. way of, of checking. But even then, if somebody gives you a file and the source code, mm -hmm. you can read that source code, but there is no guarantee that the program that you have been given, the compiled version, actually is based on that source code. It might look similar. It might, it might not be, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially what you're doing in reverse engineering is you're taking the... Um, the, you're taking the binary itself and disassemble it in a quite literal meaning. Let's say somebody gives you a car, mm -hmm. uh, but is not willing to tell you how the engine works. Yet mm -hmm. you are, you must find that out for some reason. You want to know because it's maybe the mechanic says it's not broken, but once you go on the highway, you know that it's broken. You want to fix it. You would need to know what kind of parts you would need to order. So you try and open that engine and look what's inside and Obviously, those who make programs, let's say games have anti-cheat. Um, so if you have a game that you want to prevent cheaters from getting into, you would make it as difficult as possible to open, uh, keeping the analogy to the car, to, to open that, uh, that car. So there are all kinds of detections in place. You put a lock there. But obviously, if you put the car in your garage, and you take a bolt cutter and some other tooling that you have, you mm -hmm. will eventually get into the car and understand how the engine works. Yeah. yeah. But once you get into that engine, let's say you take a normal car, you, you pop the hood open and you see what's there. There's no blueprint. Nobody's telling you like, oh, this is the, um, this is the battery. This is the, the engine. This is the, the, the parts aren't labeled. Whereas if you have blueprints, you would. So the blu blueprints are your source code, right? You have ideally, <laughs> properly named functions, variables, clean code, documented code, and you would very easily see what is what. Whereas in reverse engineering, if the analysis program doesn't know the function, if it doesn't recognize it mm -hmm. uh, based on known parts or things you've previously looked at, it will just say, this is a function and mm -hmm. it's located at this address. And that's, that's all you get. Yeah. Um, so from there on, you have to deduce what it's doing and in some cases that's easy and in some cases it can be very hard or impossible for you to do uh, or anything in between really yeah i found that um in in some companies reverse uh, malware analysts are also reverse engineers uh, engineers or vice versa when is there really a de delinealization or is it is it really dependent on the company itself? Because why, for example, are you a malware analyst? You do a lot of, obviously, reverse engineering, right? To understand the malware, but why are you not a reverse engineer? Why do they call you malware analyst? Mm -hmm. So I, <clears throat> I think that is based on the goal that you will have. Uh, and this is just my interpretation. I don't think there's a set definition uh, specifically uh, I've spoken to people who said they are malware analysts and they don't do reversing. Uh, mm -hmm. So they look, for example, at the outcome of a sandbox and, and what the execution does in there. And I have people who said they weren't malware analysts who did full reversing of malware samples, mm -hmm. uh, to which I still wonder, what is it then that you did? Um, so so there's, a, there's a wide variety. Um, in this case, I would call myself more of a malware analyst than a reverse engineer, okay. rather because that's my main goal when I do reversing. Uh, okay. If you were to say, okay. I'm a vulnerability researcher, you're probably also including reverse engineering in your research as well. Okay. Be it differencing of patches, uh, be it maybe taking apart some IoT device that you want to be looking at, mm -hmm. uh, dumping the firmware and then analyzing it. Uh, there's still an aspect of reverse engineering um, embedded into that activity. But if you say I'm a vulnerability researcher, I would assume that that's your main goal. And you can do reversing if required, but sometimes the IoT SDK that it's based on is open source. So you don't need to do much reversing. You can just look at the source code and see if there's a vulnerability in there. So, so you, ba you basically see it as a, a tool or a method to get to your end goal, basically. Yep. 
Um, I think w one thing that uh, you mentioned is like you also, you know, while while you were learning or teaching yourself how to uh, reverse engineer and uh, perform malware analysis, you mentioned that you played around with uh, Linux, MacOS, Windows. Do you have do you currently have like a specialization of okay, you know what I can I can do this in Linux or in OS uh, or in uh, MacOS, but I'm more inclined towards Windows or are you universal? So I think there's a there's an overlap, and the way I see that is um, I, I don't know much about macOS. I don't know some things about iOS, but not reversing related, more conceptually that is. Uh, so I'm not of much use there. So comparing, let's say, Android as a mobile platform to uh, Windows and Linux is different because on Android, you have your applications are running very differently. On Windows, if you execute something uh, as a normal user, the application can interact with your file system on the privilege of having your user access. If you run it as administrator, it can... Uh, obviously do more, but if you run a normal program, it can access your documents, your uh, desktop folder, your downloads, etc. Whereas on your Android phone, if you, if I send you a application and you were to install and run that, uh, I would not be able to obtain your, let's say, WhatsApp message history, because WhatsApp saves it within its own um, confined space. So each application has its own storage and you have a, let's say, shared storage. And a shared storage is what anything can access if you have the privilege to access outside storage. Now, obviously, that you can grant that or you can not grant that as a user, uh, but it's very restrictive in setup. Obviously, if you were to just grant everything, um, you can do more as an application, but even when, with all permissions, uh, permissions granted, you cannot access another application's, let's say, private data, if you will. Whereas on Windows, I could if that location is accessible to me. And on Linux, the same. If you have permissions that are read, write, execute for everybody available, then you can. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in setup. And with regards to Windows and Linux, I think the, the binaries themselves are pretty similar. Um, the more easy it gets. And with that, I mean, if you have very complicated binaries which try to do a lot of anti-analysis uh, techniques and inject themselves in other processes. Uh, at that point, it gets more down to the nature of the operating system itself. So most of the malware is obviously for the Windows operating system. So the Windows API functions that are used for that uh, are what I'm most familiar with because that's what I encounter most. But mm -hmm. if I were to see something in Linux, then the names of the Linux API functions themselves are also given within the analysis program. And it might require me to read up more on how to do process injection in Linux or something similar. But still, it's it's along the same line. I, I would compare it to maybe driving a diesel or gasoline car, uh, which requires some differences, but not that much. And obviously, if you have a very specific edge case, then everything goes out the window and you need to dig into that. But uh, generally speaking, I, I think the overlap is not as big as it might seem. Yeah, I get you. Okay. And um, when it comes to ease of starting out as a malware analyst, does it make a difference which OS you're working on? I think we lost Jennifer, but let's go on. Um, I think there is a difference between what you are referring to when you're starting on. Do you mean using or do you mean targeting? Um, you, using. So using as in what you are using, um, I would say whatever you're comfortable with. I don't think there's a necessary difference. Okay. I noticed that I have a strong preference for some systems and a dislike for some others. Uh, but I think that is to each their own. I don't think there is a uh, objective better one. I know some people who do reversing on their phone. I, I'm still intrigued by that. 
that, um, that, that I, I kind of like I kind of need an explanation on that because how would you actually have like for one the screen size of a phone yeah. is already limiting in my opinion at least but two also like the tools and the capabilities that you have you're very limited to what your operating system is allowing it yeah so you have some options uh, I know that a few persons do the, this using uh, Android and based on that, they have uh, rooted their phone, the install BuzzyBox, which allows them basic Linux-like utilities. Mm -hmm. And based on that, they can install uh, mostly command line interface tools, such as Ryzen, or, uh, okay. the, which is a fork from uh, Radari 2. And you can just put a file on your shared uh, space on your Android phone, and then you can analyze that using the, the tool itself, but yeah, I'm intrigued by the people that, that do that. Um, I'm not necessarily confident that that would be the easiest way. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't recommend it, let's put it that way. But yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be yeah. possible. A uh, few people make it work. Uh, but in general, I think if you're using Windows or a Linux distribution, then uh, that shouldn't should be pretty fine overall. Um, as to what you're targeting, I think it depends on, on first of all, your own goal, uh, yeah. but it also depends on mm -hmm. what you would be doing. If you just give somebody, this is a tool and this is a file, go for it, then it will be very rough unless they get uh, specific lessons and have somebody that can ask questions to. If you're following along on a write-up, then as long as you find a good write-up, I think, any target goes. Um, although I think it's easier if you do multiple things within the same um, area. If you're moving from one architecture to another, it will be very difficult to learn assembly language because you, for each sample, you get a new assembly language. Whereas if you keep doing the same, you'll get accustomed to structures and patterns mm -hmm. that you would see. Um, so I, I think that there is a, a use case there. and. There is one which I, which I followed, uh, but I, I don't want to say that that's the best. I do have a, I tend to give it out as advice, like this is what helped for me, mm -hmm. which is a lot of people uh, want to learn reversing, but then the way I see it, you need to learn two things. You need to understand what you're looking at on a mm -hmm. technical level, mm -hmm. but you also need to know what you're looking for. Um, so briefly put, you need to, have the technical understanding, but also the, the analyst mindset, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you need to train both, obviously. And once you have, uh, let's say you have 10 years of experience in reversing Windows binaries, somebody gives you a Linux-based binary, an L file, then it's not gonna be magic for you to find out what you need to do. Maybe it's unknown in some parts, but reading documentation and based on your experience, you'll get there eventually yeah. maybe you get there very fast maybe it's a very difficult problem it takes you a long time whereas if you're starting out both are new yeah you're you have no experience in either so a lot of people still get either taught or have taught themselves how to program in a specific language and especially if that language is of a higher level and i don't mean mm -hmm. to say more difficult but higher langu uh, level languages are where you don't need to account for all things. If you're writing in, let's say, C or C++, mm -hmm. uh, you need to allocate memory. In, and when you use that, you do that. And when, when you don't need to use it anymore, you free it. If mm -hmm. you're yeah. writing in, let's say, C Sharp or Java, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't need to do that. You simply say, I want this new object. And behind the scenes, the runtime environment will create that memory for you. And once you don't need it anymore, it will release that back to the operating system. Yeah. So that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. But additionally, if you're looking at a file on uh, that's written in, let's say, C, and it uses mm -hmm. some data, there's no indication as to what certain data is. You know it because either it looks logical, or maybe some API function requires you to, let's say, send in a string. Mm -hmm. And then you know that the data is sent there must be a string. So in some cases, there's an indication. But if you're looking at, for example, C-sharp, mm -hmm. 
if you have a binary base there and you were to loop in there, uh, the types are preserved due to the way it works. Uh, so normally you have source code, you compile that, you get a binary mm -hmm. that is executed. And a binary is for a specific architecture. So let's yep. say 64 bits Intel or 32 bits yep. Intel or something like that. Um, and it will, will execute that program. If you compile something that you wrote in C Sharp, it mm -hmm. will compile to an intermediate language. Mm -hmm. That intermediate language is then used by the runtime that is installed on that device. Mm -hmm. And the intermediate language is, uh, as they call it, just in time with a just in time compiler compiled into instructions that are for that specific machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And within the intermediate language, types are preserved. So it says, this is a string, this is an integer, this is a custom object, these are the fields. And depending on protection measures or not, the normal symbols are included as well or can be easily derived thereof. Uh, so it kind of takes you on a, like a, a journey where they're like, it's not really hand-holding because it can get quite difficult, mm -hmm. but based on my experience, it's not as difficult as just being thrown in and not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. Because now you have more of a clue as to what the code does, so you can focus on how do I analyze this? And then once you get the hang of it, you can either move on to more difficult problems or switch to learning the assembly language that is in place for other binaries that are common. And knowing how to analyze and what to look for, because a lot of the patterns are the same, um, you'll be or you might find it easier uh, to, to transition that way. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a strong background in let's say C or C++, mm -hmm. you might just dive straight into the assembly because it's a lot closer to what you're used to. So it kind of sounds almost like a treasure hunt. Like if you know kind of the clues that you're looking for, then you can make your way further on the path, but you first need to find what you're looking for basically. Yeah. And I think that a lot of, it feels like wasted time at the time uh, where you're looking into some very specific things mm -hmm. only to find out, let's say a day or two into it, that this is a uh, piece of library code. Mm -hmm. So in some cases you can have the, the file itself and you can use, let's say the C runtime um, and expect it to be installed on the end user's computer. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, you want to make sure that this very specific version you are using, or you just don't want to rely on the user having installed the standard C library or whatever you're using. Um, so you add that to your program during the compilation, which mm -hmm. makes your file bigger. But it would mean that if you were to say, I'm comparing two strings with a string compare function, um, if that function is not recognized by the tool you're using, mm -hmm. you might find that, hey, there are two strings entered here. This, this, is, this must be interesting, right? I'm looking for this because these two strings are both interesting to me and therefore the function is. Yeah. And then two days later, you're into it like, okay, it just compares them. And then you feel like you wasted two days essentially. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it's also good knowledge for in the future. <laughs> yeah, and knowing how two strings are compared are not necessarily the most exciting pieces mm. of code to reverse, but you will encounter that more in the future. Yeah. And if you can just quickly well, assess if you are like, ah, oh, this is interesting or not interesting, that's gonna save you a lot of time. And initially you obviously made the wrong choice because you went for that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, and two days later, you emerged back into the sunlight <laughs> uh, only to discover that you could have just been relaxing at the beach for two days if you just had known. <laughs> Yeah, that happens, right? But, Fair enough. Um, I mean, it's it's practical experience that you need to yes. get at some point. Yeah. So I think that the the tooling itself has progressed as well. When I was starting out, it was very. Well, I think obviously everybody says that well, it was limited. I don't want to say necessarily limited, but with the release of uh, Jira by the NSA, mm -hmm. uh, there was a real competitor to some of the other tools that was free and open source. So other tools had to step up their game to be economically viable because why pay for a license if you can get the same thing for free. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also it allows you just anyone to use that tool, uh, which I, 
I I use it on a day to day basis. I prefer it over the other tools. That's um, interesting. Wow. Okay. And it, it gives you everything you need, uh, barring some specific cases. I mean, it has upsides and downsides, right? It's objectively better and objectively worse in, in some cases. But uh, yeah, so normally the decompiler option would cost you money and in some cases a lot of it. Uh, but in this case, it's freely available and it allows you to learn assembly with that as well. Yeah. In the default view, if you select some decompiled code, it will show you which assembly instructions relate to it, which is really helpful if you want to figure out what something is doing. Yeah. Um, so I think those are the, the things that people can benefit from if you're starting out. And even if you're not starting out, um, if you're learning something new, if I have to dig into a new architecture for something mm -hmm. and I'm unsure what it does, because some of the structures remain the same. Um, even if you don't know the instructions based on how the code uh, flows, essentially, if you have a loop, it will keep on jumping upwards and start with a down jump probably to the compare part. So you don't need to understand the instructions. If you see that logic, then it will probably make some sense. But just learning on, hey, what does this instruction do and how does it work? Um, it's easier and more fun than just reading some instruction manual. I mean, of, I don't know. Thousands yeah, of pages. I, I guess that also like the whole small guidance and the explanation actually also makes it easier to potentially get into this field because it can be quite complex. And if you don't immediately have that tenacity or you, if you don't have any like in-person guidance or whatsoever, then I guess this kind of an explanation in, 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 in what you're doing can help you further along the way until you have, for example, a mentor or something. Yeah, and that's some of the things I actually looked for when I was starting out because um, much like the blogs that I, I write for corporate and I try to be as accommodating as possible, mm -hmm. but realistically speaking, uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way about any of the companies whatsoever, uh, they have a different audience because yeah. with those reports, you want to show what does the, the malware do, how do you protect against it and use that information and spread that. Whereas in, when you're learning, you want to know how is this done? So when I was starting out, I would look at some, some blogs and then they would say, yeah, so we found this sample in some paid subscriptions. I was like, well, okay, well, it's not gonna happen for me on a student uh, budget, but uh, I can still follow along, right? Because I can download this file and, and use it. Uh, but then they would have like a, one or two lines and they're like, yeah, after unpacking it, we found this. So, okay, but how did you do that, right? Because now I'm stuck. I have this file, I need to unpack it, and I have no clue. And I can only see the mm -hmm. next part of the blog that's going on. Yeah. And um, so it makes sense from a corporate perspective because you're not sharing exactly all the steps how to, otherwise you would sell trainings probably uh, rather than informing the public. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that was something I was I was missing uh, in in my uh, search, and maybe I, I didn't find the correct websites. Mm -hmm. I did encounter some great ones later on, where I was like, oh, if I had this like four <laughs> years earlier, that would have been cool. Um, it would have saved time, me two years, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but over time, I figured like if I'm missing that, then I'm probably not the only one missing it. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the reasons why I started writing blogs on my yeah. personal website. Yeah. Um, where I try to go step by step over everything you need to do. So those are rather lengthy articles, um, but they should guide you from the start to the finish and you should be able to uh, follow along mm -hmm. some sort of hand holding, if you will, um, throughout the whole process and teach you how to look for things and, and what my thoughts were when I was uh, analyzing it. Yeah. And then, Obviously, the way it's written down wasn't the first time I went over that file, mm -hmm. uh, but rather the dozen times, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that the whole story makes sense. I know the result. <laughs> exactly, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I try to include parts where I'm like, okay, I saw this and therefore I assume this, or I know it's this based on either experience or some external source that I'll try to link and hope it stays up. Yeah. Um, and just... I don't know, help people that were that are uh, looking for that information. 
uh, because these are the things the write-ups take a lot of time to make yeah but i think that they are I, I hope they're valuable to people who are starting out and look for something to essentially help them because like you said if you have a mentor where you can ask questions and maybe you have a, a professor um, in, in your um, university where you can where you have a subject that's being taught uh, with regards to reverse engineering it, that can go a long way but a lot of the, uh, us don't have either a mentor at all or maybe the mentor is as was in my case uh, the professors were into pen testing yeah so they told me like we would have loved to help you but we don't know either so we can point you in some, yeah. some places we maybe know some people that can help you but that's where our extended help uh, and we, we cannot extend it further uh, which makes sense so uh, yeah. that, that's one of my my goals there to spread the knowledge and help out uh, where I can be a role model <laughs> One, one, one thing that you mentioned earlier is that you use Ghidra for your, you know, for your malware analysis on your, you know, uh, every day on your daily job. And I'm like, oh, that's that that's really cool, right? Because I would have thought that Ghidra is used mostly for, you know, those people who are studying and just want a free tool and don't want to invest into um, other tools. But the fact that it has gotten so easy for people to get in and become experts without necessarily spending dollars in other tools is really impressive. So kudos, kudos to them. <laughs> so um, what are what are the some of the challenges that you that you are faced with as a malware analyst? I'm just trying to figure out like how long does it take you to do <laughs> normal uh, analysis. So it, it kind of depends, uh, but maybe I first need to talk. Uh, this is not necessarily meant as a promotional talk. Uh, feel free to interpret it that <laughs> way. But um, so the, as we stated earlier, right, the way of uh, malware analysis is not a, a set definition in stone. So different people mean different things. And in my work uh, with regards to malware analysis, what we do is we're not necessarily analyzing a sample, updating the signature so the antivirus can detect it and move on to the next sample. That is, uh, what I just described, is part of, of a, a job description for a model analyst. Uh, but in this case, I'm part of the uh, Advanced Research Center. And mm -hmm. what we do is we look into trends and interesting things that happen. So it could be a new family or a update to an existing family. We're not there to increase coverage necessarily. Obviously the research we do is contributing to that, but uh, we're not here to just take a ticket from the uh, system, analyze it and process it and move on to the next. So the way of working is a bit different Mm -hmm. um, and thereby we also have a bit different in terms of issues. Now, I don't want to say we, uh, as I mentioned, my issues, but the things I sometimes have are, do I want to go for this? I think that's one of the... Um, that's a luxurious issue. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's a luxury, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... So for example, for the, the wipers uh, that were used last year, I, I did quite some extensive research in there and I was watching uh, the Mandalorian at my brother's place, mm -hmm. uh, enjoying it. And then I was browsing Twitter as he was making uh, some tea. And I saw a tweet, I think it was from, I think it was ESET, but I'm not sure, or it was mm -hmm. brought from either of the two. And they said like, oh, we just like, and it was like 15 minutes old or so. And I was like, yeah, we saw this new wiper um being used uh currently on eastern europe slash mm -hmm. ukraine um, and targets therein and i saw that tweet and i think it was like friday evening or something like that or thursday evening yeah, it goes um, your weekend. yeah. <laughs> and i was like do, do i want to go for this and the reason as to, to why it's, do i want to go for this is um, in most cases, if you want to hit the news and get the most value out of your work, uh, you need to be the first putting out the, the yeah. blog. 
because if you're second then you probably have very little extra to add mm -hmm. so you need to make the choice do i go and try and be as fast as possible or do yeah. i try to go as deep as possible and get the most details take like a week or two extra mm -hmm. than the other people but come back with a report that has all the information yeah mm -hmm. or or am i just going to skip this one uh, mm -hmm. because i have other tasks that i need to do right if you know that you have I don't know, let's say travel for a conference next mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. and it's Friday evening, you're not going to make that. So you can spend yeah. your whole weekend and you're like, what, halfway through? You go to the conference and by the time you're back, 10 reports are out, right? So yeah. that doesn't work. Um, so I looked at it and, and I decided to go for it. And I think I spent like, I slept like four hours a night for like four or five days straight. Um, and I, I got the blog out and, and we were the first with that. Um, yeah. Now I... Thank you. I have to say that that wasn't pressured from corporate. That was more like, hey, if you want to do that, we'll support mm -hmm. you. If you just want like a normal weekend and actually sleep, um, then that's perfectly normal as well. So that was that was my choice uh, to do that. Um, and the risk I took as well, right? Because if you mm -hmm. were second, then you, you slept very little mm. uh, to be second, which is you can still have a good report, but it doesn't really make a splash that you wanted to. Yeah, you, you didn't accomplish the goal that you wanted to. And, and that's why I sometimes say, like, do I want to go for this? Like, sometimes you get that signal. And sometimes it's at the start of your working day where, like, this is the mm -hmm. perfect moment. And sometimes it's Friday at 7 <laughs> in the evening where you're like, do I, do I want weekend this week or not? Yeah. Uh, so it, it is a luxurious problem. Uh, and it's, it's not meant as a complaint, but it is sometimes a bit of a dilemma where I'm like, it could be interested, but if, I, if I'm going for it, I want to go all the way, um, should I? Which actually also shows that you really need to be passionate about this as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if you set these goals, then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if it's, if it's a different... Um, you can have different goals as well, obviously. Uh, and the, the harder part, maybe, uh, if you're getting into this subject, is that there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say that those who come out publicly with their stories um, shouldn't or that others should, but some mm -hmm. of the work cannot be exposed necessarily in mm -hmm. the way that other research can. If I analyze the wiper, then it benefits a lot of people to publish those results. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if I am investigating a certain malware family, how it's used, and I wrote my own tooling to emulate that malware and interact with it as if I'm an infected machine, but I'm just a script running to harvest information from the criminals. If I'm going to publish that halfway through, or even when I'm done with my research, they'll just change it. Yeah. But yeah. given that the the family, if the family you're looking into is like a big one, then you're certainly not the only one in the world doing this. Mm -hmm. So going public with, with your results is fine, right? Like, hey, we saw that this operator always targets specific geographic location. It could be interesting. Mm -hmm. But if you're exactly detailing how you did it and make code available for everybody to do it, it would be a nice learning exercise for people. But if the criminal changes the malware, you have tens, hundreds, yeah. depending on how big the family is, of other analysts that need to redo their work that they had because of that one publication. Yeah. So it's very tough if you are interested in focusing on that aspect to go public with all of your work. Which it, it can be very interesting, yeah. but it's... I mean, that, that definitely shows also the pros and the cons that you need to weigh in the back of your mind. It's not just out of pure personal interest and it's not just about, okay, I find this cool to, to start focusing on, but it's also literally like the ethical and the moral aspects. Do I want to publicize this? Do I want to affect other people's work? And do I also want to um, carry the potential outcomes of having a, a a criminal group or an adversary indeed changing the malware after these details have been publicized yeah, and to a certain extent you always have that because mm -hmm. after some of the families are really actively developed mm -hmm. and after a publication that goes really in-depth on that malware yep. they tend to change uh, so you can have that outcome but not reporting on it at all is not going to be helpful either yeah so there's a an outcome to be uh, or a decision to be made there. And depending on 
your position, your own values and norms, um, you, you will have a decision based on that. But in some other cases, it's more long-term tracking. And I spoke to some people at conferences who mm -hmm. told me things and showed me things that are really, really interested and would make great talks and learning points to share with the community, but not in a public way, which yeah, is yeah. gatekeeping for verified only people, yeah. which is really tough if you're getting into the field because, okay, sure, show me your credentials. What have you done? Yeah. It's nothing because you're entering, right? And that makes perfect sense. But it would mean that you're being kept from that information. On the other hand, you don't want anyone to just access that information because then you have the downsides that we just spoke about. Um, so it gets a bit rough sometimes. And the longer I work, the more I see that some of the things that I either assumed weren't done or was wondering why it wasn't being, being done uh, are actually done, but just not publicly. Interesting. One question, Max, uh, before we move from that. Have there been scenarios whereby, for example, you as an analyst, and not necessarily in your current employer, but you know, overall um, in your career, whereby you as an analyst uh, see that there is potential benefit in sharing this information, but the people that you work for, for example, think otherwise? Has, is, has that been a challenge or something that you've ever had to deal with? So for me, personally not, but okay. a few friends of mine, they work in uh, incident response. Mm -hmm. And um, they sometimes have this challenge where sharing the outcome of an investigation can be really helpful. Yeah. Because from, from a malware analyst perspective, we're looking at the last part of the chain. Mm -hmm. Because the initial compromise has happened, the whole network has been owned, ransomware has been deployed. Prior to that, probably data has been stolen. and. Uh, now the victim is probably being uh, extorted twice, once to not have their data spread and once to yeah. recover the encrypted systems. So it's kind of like the, the most common chain of infections. And you then get to the point, how much do you disclose from that incident? Yeah. The more you disclose, the less anonymous the customer becomes mm -hmm. uh, or maybe can even be identified. Yeah. And let's say they don't show up at the victim name and shame website uh, so technically, they could be anonymous, but it could be really helpful to share a redacted report publicly. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the University of Maastricht, uh, mm -hmm. a Dutch university, um, shared the report in yep. a redacted form after they've been, uh, they had the big incident. I think it was yep. like Christmas two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. Yes. Um, yep. which, is, which is very interesting to read. You can see what happened and how it happened. But I think a lot of, of customers, if you're doing uh, incident response, they pay you to do the incident response, mm -hmm. but then feel like we paid you for the services and now you're trying to essentially use their incident as an, an advertisement, it could be yeah. seen. Uh, so depending on how you look at it, right? Yeah. And I think that some of them really struggle because they see the same thing happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you make several of these cases public, it could be a good a lesson. Learning yeah. Um, for other companies or other security practitioners to use and, and give examples as well, because a lot of the, let's say, smaller and medium enterprises, mm -hmm. uh, they'll ask you like, okay, but what's the, what's the impact? Why would they be interested in me, right? They're not necessarily interested in you, but if the He's actor, the, the criminal is just looking for everybody that has an open door, and yeah. yours is open, you'll have ransomware in your system because they don't care if you pay or not because they can ransom a thousand companies yep. yeah. and a few will pay and they get money. You're yeah. just an so, easy target then, yeah. Exactly, right? And I think a lot of, of uh, people in, in IT security uh, know this story, um, but having a, a tangible thing like, hey, this report shows the, the damage that was done to a similar sized company mm -hmm. Yeah. in Western Europe, let's say if you're meeting somebody in, in, in that geographic location. Um, and this could happen to you. It's much more tangible than, yeah, there are risks out there. Sure. I mean, if I go to the garage, they'll tell me that there are a lot of risks with my car as well. And I need mm -hmm. to complain everything, right? 
And yeah. maybe they are correct, and maybe they just want to make money. And yeah. if you find an honest and good garage, they'll help you. And if you find some sleazy salesman, they'll probably sell you two cars. Because if one breaks down, you have a second, um, which is not necessary. So it's it's tough to dabble between what do you share, what don't you share. And if the customer eventually says no, then they have to mm -hmm. abide by that decision. Yeah. Even if they might very much disagree. And I think one of them, on top of my head, I think it was a talk at Botcom 2019, but I'm not sure if it's recorded or if it was asked mm -hmm. not to be recorded, uh, was from people working in a um, managed uh, incident response center. So they have a lot of customers. Yep. And they just took generic lessons from tons of cases and mm -hmm. shared them. And because they have so many customers, That's amazing. Yeah. nobody knows who is who. Yeah. And they also had stories from colleagues mm -hmm. that ha had something happen to them. So even if you knew the guy presenting, you wouldn't know if it's a case he handled, his colleagues handled. So I think that are, are things that are really interesting and a way yeah. to kind of circumvent the, you know, we don't want you to share this. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's also depending on how hardline your company is willing to take that stance. If they're scared to lose the client or yeah. if they're trying to grow their uh, client base that might not be the approach they're looking for uh, yeah. or it might I don't know kind of depends on how aggressive your marketing is at that point I mean there there are examples of, of uh, lessons learned from incident response which were really well shared I mean the University of Maastricht indeed but also the Marsk um, ransomware yeah. uh, incident so it does happen fortunately uh, com the community does get to share sometimes I think it's getting better now or oh, that's my perception. I think it's getting better now also because of the policies that are coming into place, yeah. right? So the ones that are necessitating that, hey, you need to inform people yeah. uh, that you've had a breach ETC. So obviously as part of that, we need to disclose some of the things like, okay, the initial access was via X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's more of a catch-22. Um, we all want to share, but by sharing, am I exposing my company more to other attacks or am I helping anyone? Why should I share? So it's it's a catch-22 question. Yeah. <laughs> Over to the last question that I had mm -hmm. for you today uh, was, and I think, and I think some of these, uh, some of the answers to this question you've intertwined in the course of your um, of our discussion is what will be the advice to those that are not necessarily trying to get into it, right? But also those that are also trying to migrate from one security field to another. So for example, if you're a pen tester, you want to go to malware analysis, or you're just a newbie and you want to go directly to malware analysis. Well, it seems your... really cool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What will be your advice? So my advice would be um, make known what you do. And mm -hmm. that can be by making LinkedIn posts. You know, you can make really <laughs> extensive ones or a, I think it's called a paper or something like that where you have like a PDF you upload on LinkedIn yep. or something like that or, or other social media. Um, or make a, a website. It can be a GitHub Pages one. It can be one you, let's say a WordPress website. I mean, I have a WordPress website. It's kind of, mm -hmm. don't need to worry about anything. Make sure your security is good though, once you start. Yes, but please. If you set that up properly and you don't use kind of weird plugins, um, fingers crossed that I haven't had any incidents. <laughs> This is not an invitation. Don't jinx it. Don't <laughs> I mean, jinx it. Mine's, mine's just vanilla because I'm, I'm so scared of, you know, all those mm. videos. <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but I mean, use a static website if you're uh, inclined uh, to do that. But regardless, show what you um, what you can do mm -hmm. because it's, a, it's very hard. Uh, like I said, some people have a very different definition from our analysis. And if you're on the hiring side mm -hmm. and you're looking for somebody, they can tell you that they're really good. But if you're really good, then it's not something you can tangible measure because language I can, if somebody is like, oh, well, I can speak fluent Dutch. 
it's mm-hmm. like okay well i can too let's have a conversation right and then mm-hmm. if there is no way to have a conversation as a native speaker i conclude that this person does not speak fluent dutch yes or if they do then it's very easy because we have a fluent conversation in dutch and i can indeed confirm that this person is fluent in dutch but there's no way to be necessarily fluent in malware analysis to just verify that for me it's not like we can just sit down and okay analyze this sample yeah you are eight out of ten ten out of ten mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's a tough way to compare and if somebody knows the right terms you can mm-hmm. use them correctly uh, you can come a long way in just talking right mm-hmm. we can talk a lot and then it might seem as if you know a lot or you might behave in a certain way that doesn't really invite for others to raise questions and thereby make it look like you're maybe a bit arrogant, but still know a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you have a website where you write about what you've done, you have very clear examples, what you've done, how you've done Mm -hmm. it and what your results were. And from a hiring perspective, if you're, if you know who you're looking for, right, because that's the objective for somebody who's hiring, they should know who they need then it's very easy to see if somebody fits into that profile. Maybe they're looking for somebody more experienced than you are, but it shows you're a quick learner. And maybe they want to take that chance and say, okay, well, join us. And and, and let's say in half a year, let's evaluate where we are. But if somebody just comes to me just talking, then sometimes people come to me like, what's a good project to do? What is your skill? Right? You, You can start out with, a very simple task from the beginning which might either be already too difficult or might be way too mundane for you because it's you just take two seconds and you have the answer mm-hmm. so showing what you can do and what you've done in the past and i'm not saying like write a blog a week and make it a 50 pager each week um, do take rest and weekend mm-hmm. but <laughs> But work on, work on your yeah work on your personal eminence make sure that you're known within the community and basically exactly. show what you can do and that you have soft skills because if you are able to write something up you're able to confer the message also yeah yeah i think those are are the things i would mostly recommend um to to people and those who have who i spoke to who have done that properly the way at least the way I see it properly, uh, they've landed good jobs and gotten into the field and uh, landed well on their feet. And some other people came to me like a year later again, asked me roughly the same question, not really having advanced. And that's a shame because in a lot in a year, if you want to, you can do a lot. Yeah. I think one of the things that I normally hear from folks when when it comes to publishing is uh, but but it's not new and no so yeah. yeah that that tends to hold them back what would be the response that you have to those that think that so the question is it's not new for who it's um, it's not new for you know it's not like novel it's not a wiper it's it's nothing unique um so yeah but i mean the, the the question it's not known to who is more to to trigger the response right because now you told me like oh it's it's not a new malware family necessarily right mm-hmm. um but even then I, I think I looked at over 30 wipers. I went a bit overboard with that one. Yeah. But a lot of them are just because a wiper essentially is like, oh, for each file, delete. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's a loop. It doesn't really get easier than that. Um, mm-hmm. You can write one in five minutes because if you're learning a new programming language, they'll tell you how to write your like hello world program and they'll teach you something about command line arguments they'll teach you about conditions right if statements etc loops Mm -hmm. Uh, now we're already halfway there right we just iterate over the file system so we loop over all files we have a condition if it's i don't know contains a certain word file size whatever then and they do input output right so we can delete a file so it gets really easy uh, so sure, it might be new, but it's not necessarily 
uh, it doesn't add anything. You have wiper number 500 that just deletes files. Mm -hmm. Not too interesting on its own, right? Maybe in the, in the grand scheme of things it is. Uh, but similarly, if we're talking about assembly instructions, the oddly enough, the blogs that caught me the most traffic to my website and social media were the ones that I never expected. I have some of the, the articles on my blog are really long. Um, I think about 50 or 60 pages detailing yes. the inner workings of a bot into great, great detail. And they got some traffic. And then I wrote like, oh, well, these are the main assembly instructions that I encountered in a brief summary. And they got major traffic. So one was actually a new family and one was <laughs> more of a list of like, hey, this is probably useful for a lot of people. And it was, so it doesn't need to be new. Um, and it, I think it also depends on the expectation you have. If your expectation is to get huge newspaper coverage of your sample or your analysis, then yeah, okay, you need to have something new, but you need to do better than new because just new is not gonna cut it for that. Yeah. Um, and if you look into why am I making this blog? What am I doing? It's for your own learning. Yeah. And it's probably to build a portfolio for your CV. So yeah. when you apply somewhere, you can say, well, these are my educations, my language skills, my soft skills, blah, 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 you know, the whole normal summary. But if you want to have a more in-depth look in my projects, go to my website, yeah. right? And then that's probably something the technical hiring manager will be looking into if your CV yeah. makes it past the original yeah. screening. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be new because if we expect everybody who enters the field to do something new, when I'm already working in this field and I'm also looking for something new, that would kind of be an impossible ask for somebody who is new into the field. It's like, hey, do my job, but then better, and then you may start. It's kind of, I don't think that's the way it works. Um, but I get that a lot of people feel like, hey, but we need something new to publish. Um, and it also depends on the audience you have if your audience is other people who are also breaking into the field, the content might be new for them as the reader. Yeah. It doesn't need to be objectively new to the entire world, as long as it's new to those who read it or enjoyable. Maybe you read something you're like, well, I know this, but the way it's written is fun. Maybe you have a great writing style that engages people. Maybe yeah. your use of memes is 11 out of 10 <laughs> and therefore it attracts people to read it. I, I don't know. There are so many reasons as to why some of the blogs are interesting and some of them are, are tedious or boring. Yeah. Uh, to read. Yep. So I think, I think that would be my answer to that question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, Max, thanks so much for all the details. Um, it was really interesting getting to know you part of the world, uh, what you do on a daily basis and just um, having some insights on how we ourselves also can navigate or our viewers can navigate it. So thank you. And- Thank you uh, for the invitation. <laughs> we hope to, we hope to uh, see you in the, um, you know, see you back in the podcast. And uh, could you please share with us the, um, I think you mentioned, I, I don't know whether the Telegram ones are, um, are things that are shareable, are, are those things that can be yeah. by other people? Yeah, so the, the groups themselves are, are probably, I'll, I'll send links to you, uh, to you for those. Okay. Um, as a, I don't want to say caution or heads up, but, um, for those who do join the groups, please do read the rules in the pinned message. We have a lot of people that join. Um, the groups are big as well, depending on which one you join, but at least several thousand people are in there. So read the rules um, and please adhere to them, stick to them, because the banning is strict, uh, as are the warnings. And I don't wanna seem unreasonable, but we have so many people that I cannot go into a discussion and just discuss like, oh, but you cannot do this or cannot do that. The rules are very explicitly stating forbidden things, which is the creation of malware in the malware research group is off limits in any case, even if it's for educational purposes, because as the admin and the, the other admins as well that help me out, 
we are not here to police the intent you have with whatever you're creating. We just don't want to fac facilitate a place that does the creation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a heads up. Please yeah. do be wary of that or the stay in the group is probably going to be short lived. <laughs> one day, one minute. Okay. And with that, thank you very much. And uh, bye bye. See you next time. Ciao. Thank you.